And, and I think that's one of the things that really I love about being in this piece of the industry is that, is that flavor has this, this key that can fit in a lot of doors. Welcome, you guys. Thank you. A nice conversation. We're trying a different format, and this is very fun. It's fun. So I think with everything going on in the market, supply chain struggles, inflation, it would be really interesting to have a conversation around how flavors play in that space. Yeah, yeah So what are you guys' thoughts around that? There's several ways, right? So number one is supply chain redundancy um, piece of this. So having consistent supply of ingredients, and part of that is um, we're hearing from our customers, commodity reduction, right? Right. So how do you reduce an ingredient and then counter, you know, at, recreate that experience with flavor it's and like other balance it, right? You got to like, mm-hmm. you can take out the commodity, but then how do you rebalance it and make it taste the same. Right. right. Consistency, it's key. And we're finding more and more that customers have had to make shifts and changes because of supply chain constraints. And, you know, oftentimes they forget that letting us come in and help them, our flavor can add that consistency back for them. Right. But there's also some other interesting dynamics from a financial perspective that I always look at and try to remind our customers, you know, Denise, you kind of coined the phrase, the ROI of flavor, which is oftentimes you can reduce the amount of volumetric ingredients you need to bring in. This can help with your shipping costs, your supply chain infrastructure, warehousing costs. And even many times you're adding stability into the product from a shelf life perspective. Um, so Even down to, I always think it's so interesting when you taste different milks, grass-fed cows, the milk tastes different. Right. Different parts of the world, the milk tastes different. Absolutely. And flavors can stabilize that profile. Right. Yeah. So then, you know, the other byproducts of that from butter, which, you know, we're getting into the season where cows in the U.S. will start changing. And then you'll see this shift of, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth, uh, Southern Hemisphere. Right. Um, And that does, it's very nuanced. It is really nuanced. And I think that, you know, we, we definitely see a shift with our customers in terms of really focus around, um, around managing cost and that sort of thing. But that doesn't take away the need to innovate. Right. Right. And I, I think you talk a lot about this, Lorette, that flavor gives you the ability to innovate within a product line. And you should Talk a little more about that. I, well, I like that because you can innovate really quickly. So if you can imagine that you have one base, right, and then you can take that profile from sour cream to cheddar to buffalo chicken, which we just had, mm. which was fantastic, delicious. So you can be very versatile in your formulating and even your line. You know, your line time. You don't, yeah, and really, you're changing the flavor component and working with us. We can ensure that the the delivery of that flavor, so the type, you know, liquid or spray dry, whatever the need is, we can help with that so there's not these huge changeovers. Right. Right? And it simplifies bill of materials. Um, you're not adding in equipment, but yet you can have different line extensions from these great products that consumers, and I think consumers are demanding that almost yeah. today, right? When they mm-hmm. like a product and a base, they're like, give me variety, give me variety. Yeah, we can right. help. We can help with. We saw a lot of skew rationalization during oh, COVID, right. especially this past year, right? CPGs focused on keeping their core items back on the shelf. Right. Consumers are also still interested in those unique, innovative products, right? Yeah. So this enables them to get something to the market fast to meet those consumer needs, yeah. but still keeping costs. Uh, you know, keep in mind costs and supply chain uh, efficiencies as well. Yeah. That's very important. So I'm thinking of even how Ed Long started. It's kind of an interesting story that probably most people know, but maybe some don't. But there was never a cheese cracker on the market. 
before we came along. Not even Cheez-Its? Nope. No, this was what, 1914. Oh. <laughs> Got it. But not really that. Sorry, that's not even true. This was when my dad joined, so more in the 60s. Okay, yeah, 60s okay. And 70s. okay. Yeah. Great. So because <laughs> cheese is so volatile and a mm-hmm. cracker it goes 450 degrees and the flavor just pops off. Right. So he came Not up with the Not only the greasy mess as well when right. you try to bake off cheese. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So first commercially viable cheese flavors were created around then. And before that, there wasn't a cracker. And the return on investment of flavor, I think that's huge. So it's heat stability that the real cheese is not heat stable. And just recently, well, time warp, I'd say within the last couple of years, we had a food scientist come in from a big CPG company. She was young and just out of food science school. Right. And she was trying to make a Gouda cracker. Right. Piling real Gouda in there, which is not commercially viable. You can't sell a cracker with real Gouda. You, the price point would be like $5 for a cracker. So we had to teach her how you can put a touch of Gouda in there for the label. Yeah. You just sprinkle some in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you could say made with real Gouda. No, a little more than that. But then the flavor is what's carrying that profile. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And we can dial in the profile. Definitely. You know, that's... Because do you want it to be a smoky Gouda or an aged Gouda or a fresh Gouda? Right. And I think that some of the other, we talked, we use the word nuance. It seems subtle, but impactful. Super. And that's where we shine. And it gives the end product a fingerprint that the competitors cannot duplicate. Right. Right. That's right. It's like the Moorish thing. You know, those things that you want to eat that are, I love that word Moorish. It's an English term, I think, <laughs> they use over in England where you you just can't stop eating it. It's yeah. like, you know, snackable. That's great. I think if we kind of think about, you know, all of these things, I think we have to consider and, and food developers have to consider that there are a number of challenges that are being faced right now and that are being anticipated as we go forward and really thinking about flavor in those contexts, whether they're trying to reduce commodities and reduce costs in other other places, um, or trying to innovate in a time when they are being much more cost conscious, that ability right. to extend lines and to do things quickly, right? I mean, we, we know in this industry that innovation can fail, but you can fail fast and it's not this enormous, overwhelming investment right. it, it in can, time. Yeah, of time mm-hmm. and 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 other things that can be done within the context of a line, and and I think that's one of the things that really I love about being in this piece of the industry is that is that flavor has this this key that can fit in a lot of doors yes. and open a lot of doors to solve the problems that. People Sometimes very facing. surprising doors. We had a customer working on a, a coffee beverage that was like a milky coffee beverage, like creamy. Right. They came into our lab and our f- application scientists used a mozzarella flavor. Yeah. Didn't tell the customer because if you told them, you know, then right. they're like, oh, it tastes cheesy. Yeah. So it made them blind taste and that was what went to market. He's like, that was perfect. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's surprising. Right. What types of flavors are going to answer that solution. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Look at the type of customers we work with. I think it's becoming more and more evident that sometimes it's better to just pull in the experts yes. in a specific area. Yes. And so, you know, we're experts in dairy and non-dairy flavors that can bring that dairy essence, but in a plethora of product types. That's right. right. And so they shouldn't limit their flavor portfolio to just the big few when if you really want a targeted approach, let let the experts come in. Yeah. I love that. And the concept of dairy and non-dairy not being only, you know, ice cream, yogurt, it's like those flavor profiles are versatile across every product. We find the tough dairy solutions when no one else can. Right. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Solutions when no one else can. Yeah. And I, when you were saying that, I think of, we have many stories where a customer could be working on something for like 12 to 18 months and they come into our lab and they solve it in a day, yeah. literally a day. And they are amazed. And then you have them for life. Right. And you're true partners. Yeah. Yeah. But I love that, the scenarios where 
when not only are we a hero for solving their challenge, but they're an internal hero within their organization because they're bringing that product to life. Yes. I love that. Nothing better than seeing it on the shelf, right? So we rewarding. Yes, Especially yeah. the really tough, challenging ones. The, yeah. It brings joy that's, to the whole organization. That's when I'm in awe. When you And you can taste it from the beginning to the end, and you're yeah. like, wow. That's yeah. true science. Yeah. It is. And art. I think that's right. And I think that that goes back to Brenda's point, which is bringing in the experts or coming to the experts. I mean, I know that for yes. us, you know, and we know we collaborate with a lot of partners, you know, coming in and just really working shoulder to shoulder to solve those problems. It can happen a lot faster. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have an open invitation right, for our customers that. to to just come in and work side by side with us. And the power of being able to tweak so quickly in matters of minutes and just, because really flavors are such, they're so strong and you go from point one to point two to point three and you have a totally different profile. Yeah. So to be able to do that in real lifetime, it saves months. And have sensory there, yes. you know, Julie. Shout out to you. you. Um, you know, interacting with the product. You know, we we were at a session on Monday this week where she tasted something and immediately was like, right. we just need like um a marshmallow yeah. flavor in this, right? Like just knew exactly what needed to be yes. added to finish the profile out. So sometimes That's you don't beautiful. need a GC analysis to break it down. Sometimes you just need that human interaction. That very talented say, human. And it's, is, yeah. it's uh, not everybody has that God-given talent. That right. is for sure. Right. right. I certainly don't. But I love watching it in action. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and yeah. they know it just needs this or that to the chemical level. Yeah. It's cool. Oh, well, yeah. That's where you, have, you, you combine the sensory. So Julie's evaluation and her team, the application scientists know how of how to apply the flavor right. and then the flavorists you know years and years of experience and know-how to then know what exactly is needed to put in there right so it's like a, you know you go back to the triangle yes, right that three-pronged triangle. approach to say this is how we're going to get to that solution right and yeah, so nice. few flavors in the world it always amazes me I, that is true but i also we do have this amazing advantage, I think, where some of our competitors don't, that our applications team, who are amazing, um, they're under the same roofs with our flavorists. That's right. Yep. So that's not the case everywhere, but they work so closely together, literally can run upstairs and say, we think it needs this. And before you know it, they're running back downstairs. Right. Um, and you know, even that support with our global teams and our regional ability to understand the differences in Europe versus LATAM versus the U.S. and having that toolkit, we, we can't underestimate that, and that helps us drive solutions faster. Yeah, right. very true. Yeah, that reminds me of the global tasting tour we did over the right. last year where we took our customers on a tour in specific applications but highlighted different global preferences, which really showcases how we understand those nuances, those complexities, that cheddar isn't just cheddar. Everyone here has a different definition of cheddar probably. Right. And right. how do we recreate that for the customer? Mm-hmm. This is what we do. Yeah. It's really the strength, too, of the diversity of our employees because when you want something that's true, Indian profiles, for example, we have people that were born and raised there and they'll be like, yeah, that's not it. Right. You know, and that's huge. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Same as, yeah, that's, I think that's a very, um, very important part of being a global company and, and having that, that capability being diverse in many ways and being global and really bringing that in because flavor is, um, I mean, flavor is a big part of, or food is a big part of culture and flavor is what yes. makes food so unique to to each of those uh-huh. places. And as you're thinking about bringing products into other markets, you really have to think about the flavor profile. Mm-hmm. So I think that, um, you know, it's not hard if you sit down and really look at it to say, wow, the ROI on flavor is huge. Mm-hmm. If you consider all of the problems that you can solve. So thank you guys so much. I think this was a really awesome conversation and hopefully our listeners are going to have some great takeaways and learn something about the ROI of flavors. Yeah. Yeah.